for another day of Rambam, Hilchas Yisaydei HaTayra, the foundations of the Torah. And today we're learning chapter 2. Yesterday we learned chapter 1, where we talked about the existence of Hashem and all the elements that we're required to know as part of fulfillment of that mitzvah, as well as the unity of Hashem, the fact that Hashem is one in a completely singular and non-composite way. Today we move on to the next mitzvahs in the section of these laws of Hilchas Yisaydei HaTayra, which are Ahava and Yira, the love and the fear that every single Jew needs to feel towards Hashem. And as we're going to see, according to the Rambam, the way Jewish law frames this mitzvah, it's not only an emotional mitzvah, but also an intellectual one. In other words, more than the feeling of love and fear that every single Jew needs to have, is also the intellectual process that he needs to go through in order to arrive at that conclusion. And the Rambam will go at great length and into great detail, not only in today's chapter, but in tomorrow and the next day's chapter as well, to describe the great and wondrous deeds of Hashem, which are supposed to be the catalyst for us to be able to think about them, and then thereby arrive at the concluding feelings of love and fear for Hashem. So here we go. Perik Sheni, chapter 2. Says the Rambam in Halacha Aleph, Hokel Hanichbad Vahanayra Hazeh. This honorable and awesome God about which we learned in the last chapter. Mitzvah la'ohava yuliyira isa, it's a mitzvah to love him and to fear him. Shane'emar, as it says, and the Rambam does this very often, he brings the scriptural source right away. It says in the verse, and we're very familiar with this verse, ve'ohavta is Hashem alekecha, you must love Hashem your God. Ve'ne'emar, and it says, as Hashem alekecha tira, you should fear Hashem your God. So here we see clearly Torah commanding us to both love and fear Hashem. What's interesting, as the Rebbe points out, is that the Rambam, as we'll see, is describing a love not typical to the way we think of love. We're typically accustomed to thinking of love as a feeling of closeness. When you are close to somebody, you love them. The Rambam's definition, the halachic dry definition, legal definition of love of Hashem is a love that's intertwined with fear. It's a love that actually is aroused from distance. You feel so far from the person who, whom you are loving, from your beloved, that it arouses a strong desire of connection. Not necessarily the closeness, but the desire to connect. And we'll see this clearly indicated in the Rambam's language, which he employs in these halachas. And the Rebbe actually uses this um, point to explain why the Rambam chooses the curious name for Hashem, Hakel. In the whole last chapter, the Rambam has been referring to Hashem as Eloka, God, or Matsui, the existence, the primary existence. Here the Rambam uses the term Kel, it doesn't even match to the verse that he quotes. He, in both verses, Hashem is referred to Hashem Elokecha, God, your God. Why does he choose the word Hakel? Because Kel is the name that denotes God as a God who does things. It's one of the more famous descriptive terms for Hashem. In fact, in the 13 attributes of mercy, Kel is the first one. Hashem, Hashem, Kel, Rachun, Bechanun. So it's a reference to the fact that the God that we're seeking to love and fear is the God that can be gleaned from within His actions and from within His great deeds, from within His creation. So love and fear comes from intellect, from academic analysis, and the love and fear are both similar in that they are inspired by distance. One, one realizes how far he is, how small he is comparable to Hashem. That brings him to a desire for closeness, that's ahava, and then a yir'ah, a complete and utter bitul, self-nullification. Let's see how the Rambam describes it. Halacha base. Number two. What's the way to achieve love and fear of Hashem? It happens at the time that a person thinks deeply and contemplates in the, in the works and in the creations, the wondrous ones, the great ones that Hashem made. One needs to think into Hashem's deeds. And then he observes from within creation Hashem's great wisdom, which has no comparative, there's nothing comparable to it in this world. And it also has no limit. And that immediately leads to the conclusion of He loves, praises, glorifies, and here's the key word, and he goes into a great yearning a great desire, he's aroused with a great taiva, Leida Hashem HaGadol, to further know this great name. So in other words, he observes creation, 
And that leads to a feeling of desire for closeness. That's the Ramam definition of love. And in that itself, what's the desire for? The desire is to know Hashem further. So in a way, love and fear of Hashem are an extension of the mitzvah in the last chapter of knowledge of Hashem. Kemaisha Amar David, as David HaMelech said, Tzoma nafshi lelikim. My soul thirsts for Hashem, lekel choy, for the living God. The love is to thirst. And then, the thirst and the distance, when you consider, when you think about these very matters, it also leads to a second conclusion. Not just a feeling of distance, but miyad immediately hu nirtala achayrov. He recoils. He's pushed in shocking, in shocking form. He's shocked backwards. The year of the yifchad, and he fears, and he awes. The yedeya, and he knows, he becomes aware, shehu briyak tana, that he is just a small creature. Shvala afela, lowly and dark, oimedes bedas kala mu'uta, standing with a light and minuscule mind, lifnei tmim deyes, before he who is perfect of knowledge. In other words, you realize how nothing you are compared to Hashem. And that's yira, that's fear. Kemoisha amar David, as David amelech again said, another verse, Quoted from Psalms, When I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, the conclusion is, What is man that you should remember him? I observe your great heavens, I observe your majestic creation, and I want to know, what am I worth? That's the Yira. So this Ahava and this Yira, love and fear have to be achieved, and they're achieved through Yisbainin, through thinking. The Rebbe, in countless letters and many talks, tells us, that the Rambam here is extremely precise in his wording, and he's communicating to us a fundamental idea, that which is actually fundamental to all of Hasidus as we know it today, and that is that the mind is the pathway to the heart. The key to emotional arousal in the service of Hashem is to engage your mind in an academic process of study. Chabad actually means Chachma bin Adas, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And if you look into the Rambam himself, you see him alluding to those three expressions. Yisbainen is Bina, Chachmasa is Chachma, Leda is the Das. The Ramam actually hints to Chabad. There's actually a note, a footnote from the Rebbe in one of his talks where he lists tens of places throughout the Ramam's work that the Ramam alludes to Chachma bin the Das and he groups them together. Chabad, the brain, is the path to the heart. And the Ramam says, Ulefi hadvarim elu, and based on these concepts, because there's a mitzvah to achieve love and fear of Hashem, and the way to do so, is to contemplate God's creation. I see fit, says the Rambam, and in the vayar klolim gedolim. I will explain great rules, great principles, mimaisei ribayin ha'ilamim, from among the works of the master of the world. Kidei sheyiu pesach lamevin le'ohei ves Hashem. So that they serve as an entranceway to the understanding, to the keen person, to love Hashem. In other words, Rambam says, I'm going to engage in a long discussion that's going to cover some of the most elemental and fundamental concepts in creation, and they're going to be our entry point, our access point to love and fear of Hashem. As our sages have expressed, when they were talking about the concept of loving Hashem, they said these words, from within this, from within creation, you will come to recognize he who said and the world came into existence. In other words, Hashem can be gleaned, insight into Hashem can be gleaned from within his creation. And we're going to see that the Rambam will spend a considerable amount of time on this, uncharacteristically of the Rambam. The Rambam is extremely terse, extremely brief. He gets everything in shorthand, and here he goes off on a huge, what seems to be tangent, about different elements in creation. And the Rebbe explains it's because all of this is a pathway to love and fear Hashem, but more importantly, the overarching theme of these chapters is Yidiat Hashem, the knowledge of Hashem. Part of fully knowing Hashem is to be engaged, at least basically, in the knowledge and the understanding of the workings of his creation. Halacha Gimel, number three. And here the Rambam begins to categorize Hashem's universe. Kol ma'ashabara kadosh baruch hu ba'ilamai, everything which Hashem created in his world, nechlak b'shleisha halakim, can be divided into three major categories. Mehen, bruim, among them are creations. Shehein mechubarim v'nigaylam v'tzura. These are the creations that are most familiar to us. They are comprised of both matter and form. Vehem hoivim v'nifsadim tamit. They are constantly coming into existence and constantly disintegrating out of existence. Kimoi, for example. Gufay sa'adam v'habehema, the bodies of humans, the bodies of animals, the hatzmachim v'hamatchis, and vegetables, metals, the classic creation that we observe all around us. They are, they are comprised of what's called golem and surah, 
both matter and form, and there's a constant rotation. A human is born, a human passes away, his body disintegrates and returns to dust. There are other creations that are also comprised of a matter and a form. However, they do not change from one body into another and from form to form like the first category. These are their form is constantly set into their matter. The shape they assume when they were created stays for eternity. They do not change like the previous category. The Heim, and they are classically Hagalgalim, Hakechavim Shabahem. The spheres and the stars within them. The stars and the planets, as we observe them outside of our atmosphere, are completely unchanging. The same body in the same form, always there. So, in a way, they share uh, properties with our creations, the ones that we observe in this world. However, they are what the Talmud calls kayamim bi'ish. They exist in their indi- individual state. The sun doesn't change. It is what it is from the day it was created. The ein galmam kish ar glamim, their form, their matter, excuse me, is not like any other matter. The loy tzurasam kish ar tzuras, neither is their form like other forms because of the eternal element that they possess. Umehen bruim, says the Rambam, and then there is another category of creations, tzura beloy galim klal, a form without a matter, a spiritual form with no physical counterpart. The heim hamalachim, these are the angels, shahamalachim enam gufu gvia, for angels are not a body, they are not a form. Elotsurais nifrade zumizu, they are rather simply forms in the spiritual sense, separate from one another, distinguished from one another in a way that we will soon elaborate upon. What makes them different from each other isn't the fact that they take up physical space, rather, it's a conceptual and uh, a content-related difference. The Rebbe notes that, of course, we're talking about when Ramam says they're a form with no matter, we mean they're a form with no physical matter. That's the matter that we're negating. There is definitely, as we're going to see, um, something which does differentiate one angel from the next, and in that way you could consider them to have some kind of a goof, some kind of a, a, a form, a, a body, albeit not a physical one. By the way, the Rebbe notes in uh, his personal diary, in the famous Rishima, which is called the Rishima Samanoira, it's an uh, elaborate thesis on the different opinions of the position of the menorah in the temple. But there's a point where he notes on this Rambam that the Rambam essentially divides all of creation into three worlds. The lowly world, that's the universe as it exists in front of us, the elevated world, the world of the stars and the spheres, and then the spiritual world, the world of the angels. And in the same way, this trio, this concept of three elements, is reflected in many areas of of Judaism. The human being has three categories in the way he relates to the world. Machshava, dibur, and ma'aseh, thought, speech, and action. The Bet HaMikdash, the nerve center of the world, had three major parts. The Azara, the outer courtyard, the Heichal, which was the inner sanctum, and then the Kodash HaKodashim, the Holy of Holies. Jews are also divided into three parts. And here, the Rebbe goes a little bit t- different than what we would think. We would think just Kohanim, Levi, and Yisraelim. The Rebbe says it's, it's a bit different. It's regular Jews, Kohanim and Leviim come together in a group, and the Kohen Gadol, he stands alone. That's why it, the, Jewish, the, the Jewish categories actually matched the temple categories. Regular Jews could go only into the courtyard. Kohanim and Leviim sometimes could go into the inner sanctum, but only the Kohen Gadol could go into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. And then we have also in time, we have weekdays, Shabbat and Yom Tov, and Yom Kippur. That's why only on Yom Kippur was the day that the Kohen Gadol went into the Holy of Holies, because that represents the highest level of Hashem's creation, the highest world, as the Raman describes it here. Halacha Dalit. If it's true, as we've posited, that Malachim, angels, go into the category of them who have form and no matter, Mahu what then? is the meaning of that which the prophets say, that they observed an angel as fire and with wings. So like we had yesterday, when it came to anthropomorphism, bodily descriptions of Hashem, the Rambam said that it's to be understood metaphorically. Here too, we say the same thing. Everything was being um, communicated in prophetic vision and as a riddle. To say, actually the fire 
was bringing out this point, that it's not limited to a regular physical body. It isn't heavy as regular bodies are. Matter is heavy. Matter has weight. Instead, like a fire, which has no weight, so too do the angel's body don't count as regular matter. As it says, Actually, Hashem is referred to as a fire. The Torah says, Hashem, your God, is a consuming fire. It's not actually a fire. It's a metaphor. And another verse also communicates this point. He makes his angels winds. Same thing. Wind, air, has not, doesn't have mass as we know it today in, uh, in regular, uh, regular objects. Of course, it does have a certain type of mass, but not the classic type of mass. In the same way, a malach's body does not have um, weight. It's a tsura beloy gerlem. It's a form with no heavy matter, as it were. If so, what then distinguishes one form from another? And they are not bodies. Lefi says the Rambam she'enon shavim bimitziyusa. That's because they're not identical in their existence. Just like two concepts, what separates one piece of intellect from another is the fact that conceptually they are different. Angels also are different one from another qualitatively. Every single angel exists in gradation. Each one is progressively lower in spiritual stature than its fellow. And in fact, it achieves its own life from the power of the angel that stands above it. One above the other. And they all collectively exist from the power of Hashem, blessed be He, and His goodness. So angels exist in a progressive hierarchy. This is the meaning of that which Shloyma was trying to hint in his wisdom when he said, This is a verse in Kohelet, in Ecclesiastes, where Shloyma Amalek says, For above the highest one, there is an even higher one who watches. In other words, no matter how high you are in spiritual stature as an angel, there's somebody higher than you and progressively higher until the point where you reach Hashem Himself. And now we're going to go into quite a long conversation about angels because this is the first element of Hashem's creation that the Rambam wants us to be aware of to bring us to love and fear Hashem. This that we just said, that each angel stands progressively lower than the high stature of his fellow, of course, is not meant spatially. It's not he stands on a higher stair, as though there's a staircase in heaven, and one angel stands higher than the other. As we would use the expression physically in human terms, that one man could be standing on a higher rung than his fellow. Rather, it's as though we would employ the term if you have two wise men, and you would say, that one is greater than his friend in wisdom. Which is meant to communicate the concept that this one is greater in stature than the other one, but not in space. In the same way, when we say about the angels, one on top of the other, that's what we mean. One higher than the other, one greater than the other. As we say about a cause, that it's above the effect. Actually, we're talking about in today's Rambam, how intellect brings to emotions. Contemplation is the cause, that's the ila. The emotion, ava v'yira, is the alul, is the effect. So what would we say? That the intellect stands higher than the emotions. We don't mean higher in space, we mean higher in concept. So the same thing applies to the malachim. And now, the Rambam lets us know a fascinating concept. Halacha Zayin, number seven, Shinoi Shmois HaMalachim, the difference in angels' names we find in the Tanakh. Many different names, many different titles. For angels, the difference in those titles, Al Shem Malasamhu, is actually because of their stature. Depending on the stature of a given angel, that's the name that he gets. Olefichach, and therefore, says the Rambam, the highest level is Nikraim Chayos HaKodesh. They are called the Holy Chayos. Vehing Lamayla Min and they are the highest level. From a short examination in the commentaries, it actually becomes clear that each name 
of the angels communicates within the name how they're higher or lower. For example, the chayos, the reason why the chayos are the highest is because the word chayos means life, animation, energy. Divinity is their life. The totality of their identity is godliness. That's the highest level of an angel. They are above all. Then you have the oifanim. The oifanim are also described in Hashem's chariot in the opening uh, chapter of Ezekiel. They are described as being part of the divine chariot, like a chariot that has no identity outside of the fact that it serves its rider. So too, these angels are called wheels to the chariot in the sense that they serve fully and only Hashem. They're not chayos. You can't say about them that their life completely is Hashem, but their servitude. In other words, their, their purpose, their mission is dedicated solely to Hashem. They're the second level. Ve'er elim, and then we have er elim. Er elim literally means mighty ones or great ones. But also the word er el can be a mixture, an amalgamation of the words er e kel. I see Hashem. Their life is not godliness. They may not be a wheel to the chariot, but they identify themselves as those who see Hashem. In other words, they don't have any identity as it refers to a lower realm. They're only consumed with observing God. And then we have the chashmalim. Then we have those that, the angels that are called chashmal. Now, uh, chashmal is, in the Gemara, in the Talmud, it's, it's, it's explained as a fiery being, chash, has to do with esh, with fiery, and mal means memalel, to talk. That's one interpretation. They talk in praise of Hashem. However, there's another interpretation which says, chash mal means itim chashot, itim memalelot. Sometimes they're quiet, sometimes they talk in praise of Hashem. So here we have the first level of angel that's a bridge. The are Elim, the one before this, they're still seeing God. The Chashmalim are a bridge. Sometimes they're talking about Hashem, sometimes they're quiet. Or the opposite way around. Sometimes they're quiet. Quiet can, can signify a deep sense of bitul, self-nullification. When you're talking, if you're talking about something, it implies distance from that thing. Either way, they're a bridge. They're a bridge between two realities. And then we have Usrafim. Then we have the Srafim. The Serafim are another level of angels. We mention them every day in davening. And Serafim means burning. The Alter Rebbe in Hasidic discourse translates this concept as they are burnt up, they are consumed with their love of God. However, the very fact that they're being burnt up again implies distance. So they've crossed the bridge. They're in an outside reality. They have to burn themselves up in the love of Hashem. And then we have Malachim, regular angels. The classic word for angels is Malach, but literally Malach means emissary. This is even further. Now you're an emissary to the outside world. Ve'lehim, angels are also sometimes called Elohim. And in this, in this concept, it doesn't mean God. It means Elohim like a judge. Many times in the Torah, a judge is referred to as Elohim. So they're supervising. A judge is actually not just being sent to someone, but he's supervising the society that's outside of the realm of godliness. Uvinei Elohim. Then you have a lower level that are called the children of Elohim. They're, of course, on an even lower spiritual level. Then you have Ukruvim, the angels that are called cherubs. Kruv actually literally means a king, according to the primary commentator on these halachas, the Purush. And then you have Ishim. Angels sometimes are actually called humans. Those are the ones that are closest to the human level. So we see here ten names of angels, progressively lower one from the other on the hierarchy of being in touch with godliness. And Kol Elu, Asara Hashem, says the Ramam. All these ten names. Shanikru bahen hamalachim, that the angels ha- are called by, al shem eser mailus shalahen heim, are because of their ten degrees of stature. Umaylo she'en lemaylo mimeno, the level that has no level higher than it, ele mailo sakil baruch hu, only the level of Hashem himself, blessed be he, he mailo satsura shenikras chayas, is the advantage, is the stature of the form which is called chayas, they're the highest level. Lefichach nemar benavua, therefore the the prophecies oftentimes describe them as shehin tachas kisei akaved, that they are located under the chair of glory, God's divine throne, because they're right there, closest to Hashem. On the other extreme, we have umayla asiris, the tenth and lowest level of the hierarchy. He umayla satsura shemikras ishim is the level of form that's called ishim humans. Vehem hamalachim hamadabrim imanavim. Those are the angels that are assigned to speak with the prophets. Venirim lehen demare hanavua. They are the ones that appear to them in their prophetic visions. Therefore, they're called humans. For their advantage is immediately close to the advantage to the level of the human mind. Of 
course, there are thousands and myriads of angels, but the idea is, just like we see here in these ten basic names, that they each indicate a progressively lower or higher level of attachment to godliness, so too every individual angel who exists in every individual category, what differentiates one from the other is their capacity to understand and relate to Hashem on a progressively higher and higher level. The Rebbe observes in a letter, actually, that over here we see that the Rambam's opinion is that an angel is higher, is greater than a human. Many times in Hasidic philosophy we learn that in Neshama, an angel has greater capacity, a soul has greater capacity than an angel. But here it seems like, at least in relationship to Hashem, an angel has a greater capacity than a Neshama. Halacha Ches, number eight. The Chol Hatsur Yisraelu, all forms, no matter what level you are in the ladder of angels, every single angel, Chayim, lives. And the Rebbe explains that lives means lives eternally. Because there is a category of angels that are described in the Talmud where Hashem expresses displeasure at them and burns them. Those angels are not such angels that exist forever. The ones we're referring to here in these halachas are the angels that exist forever. And they recognize deeply, intellectually. They recognize the Creator. And they know Him, they're aware of Him with a great knowledge, very great knowledge. However, every form only understands God insofar as their level of advantage and intellect can get them. Not according to God's ultimate truth. They understand Hashem on their terms, not on His. Even the highest level of the highest HaKadosh. Who cannot fathom, cannot grasp the truth of the Creator as He is. Rather, its mind is limited, it's short, in terms of grasping and knowing. Avol. But Masages Vyadas Yaiser, it understands and grasps more Mimasha Masages Vyadas, Surashalamata Mena, more than that which the, the form under it understands and grasps. The Khin Kol Mailo Maila, and so too in the hierarchy of, of levels, Ad Maila Asiris, till the tenth and lowest level, Gamhi Yadas Habere Deya, it also knows the creator with a knowledge, Sha'im Koyach Bineha Adam, which is not within the capacity of the human being, which is comprised of a form and a matter, can grasp and know like it. So the lowest angel is very far from what the highest angel knows, but it's more than what any human can ever know. But of course, nobody is aware and conscious of the Creator as he knows himself. And now, the Rambam goes into a very, very deep, esoteric, mystical concept, the knowledge of Hashem Himself. Till now we're talking about the awareness that angels outside of God have of Hashem. And now we're going to progress and speak a little bit about the Yedi'ah, the knowledge of Hashem Himself. Kol Hanim Tzoyim, says the Ramam, Halacha Tess, number nine. Everything which exists, chutz min outside of the Creator. Mitzura harishayna ad yatush katan sheyiyeh betabur aretz. From the first, primary, foremost, highest stature form, highest stature angel, to the smallest gnat, or mosquito, that exists in the center of the earth, the common denominator between them all is that they have all come to exist from within the strength of God's truth. And because we can all trace our source back to Hashem, says the Rambam, because Hashem knows Himself, is aware of Himself, and He recognizes His greatness and His beauty and His truth, he therefore is aware of all, and nothing can be concealed from him. If Hashem were to be aware of the world in the sense of collecting information, every piece of information would affect him differently, and he would have to amass a tremendous amount of information in order to be able to retain the knowledge of everything that's happening in the world. But in fact, with Hashem, his knowledge does not work from the outside in. It works from the inside out. Because everything comes from within Hashem, and Hashem is aware of himself, he is thereby perforce, aware of everything that happens outside of him. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says the Ramah Malach HaYud, Hashem Makir Amitoy recognizes His truth V'yedeya Oisa Kamei Shehi and knows it as it is, on its highest, purest form. V'ein Yedeya Bedeya Shehi Chutz Mimenu. He does not know things with a knowledge that exists outside of him. Kamei Shehi Anu Yedem as we, human beings, process knowledge. She'ein Anu V'dayteinu Echad. Us and our knowledge are not one. We come into the world so much information exists outside of us, we must then learn, process, and acclimate that information into our own consciousness. So everything begins outside of us, and we bring it in to, uh, to our brains and to our minds. 
Aval Abayre is Baruch with the Creator, blessed be He, who Vedaita Vechayav Echad, Him, His knowledge and His life are all one. Mikol Tzadu, Mikol Pino, Vechol Derech Yichud, from all sides, from all corners, and in every possible way that unity can be conceived. Sheit Lamale Hayachai Bechayav, Vyadeya Bedeya Chutz Mimenu, because were He to be alive with a life, and were He to know knowledge outside of Him, were Hashem to work in an outside in form, that would automatically mean that there are multiple gods. Who v'chayav v'dayta? Him, his, his life, and his knowledge. Being Adar came, but that's not so. Rather, Hashem is one, as we established in the last chapter, on every side, every corner, and every possible way of unity. Therefore, this leads you to the conclusion, and these words of the Rambam are famously quoted in Tanya and all over Hasidic discourses. Who hayadeya? Hashem is the knower. Vehu hayadua, and he is the known. Vehu hadeya atzma, and he is the knowledge itself. Hakoil echad, everything as one, because Hashem's consciousness works from the inside out. He is the truest being. Everything comes forth from his truth, and therefore, because he's aware of himself, he is perforce aware of everything. The davar zeh, and after what the Rambam has given us, this wonderful piece of information, he then lets us know a major disclaimer. This thing I just said, in koyach bapela omrei, there is not enough strength in the mouth to say it. There isn't enough strength in an ear to process it, to hear it. There isn't enough strength in the heart and the mind of man to truly and properly internalize this. Hashem exists in a completely different way. And therefore we can make a very interesting scriptural observation. In the Torah, whenever we employ a language of swearing, a language of an oath, it was very popular to swear by the life of someone else. For example, Che Paro. I swear by the life of Paro. V'chei nafshecha. And I swear by the life of your soul. In each of these occasions, the word che, life of, is written in the construct form, which indicates that the life is separate from he who it's enlivening. The life of Paro, the life of your soul, life and soul, life and Paro are separate entities. However, when it comes to Hashem, and a similar language is employed in the Tanakh, we never say the life of Hashem. I swear by the life of Hashem. That would imply that the life and Hashem are two separate entities. Ela chai Hashem. Rather, what we say is Hashem is alive. Hashem lives. I swear by the fact that Hashem lives, because Hashem and His life are intertwined. Because the Creator and His life are not two entities. Like the lives of uh, bodies that are alive or even the lives of angels. Rather, he is alive within himself. Lefichach, therefore, He doesn't recognize and know the creations because of the creations. It doesn't start with them, and then that knowledge is assimilated into, him, into his consciousness. Rather, as we know, we know things by taking things outside and assimilating it into our brains. Rather, Raman repeats, Hashem knows them from within Himself. Because He knows everything. Because He knows Himself, He knows everything. Because everything relies on Hashem for its existence. And so we have, in sum, in today's chapter, information that A, love and fear is reached by contemplating creation. B, all of creation can be divided into three categories. Beings with form and matter that disintegrate. Beings with form and matter that don't disintegrate, and beings with form and no matter, that's the angels. We've expanded upon the concept of angels and the fact that every single angel is in a progressive hierarchy of awareness of God. And we've gone to the highest level of awareness, which is God's awareness, that works from the inside out, not from the outside in. And now the Rambam tells us, All of the things that we have said about this topic, in the last two chapters, today's and yesterday's, can be basically compared to a drop relative to the sea. From that which has to be explained. We're going to see in two chapters from now, Zaramam is going to employ a similar metaphor, but he's going to say it's a drop in the bucket. Now, a drop in the bucket is also very minuscule, but a bucket is limited. Here the Ramam says it's like a drop in the sea because the true involvement in this topic of understanding how Hashem and his closest angels work are way, way beyond regular human comprehension, certainly way, way beyond just two chapters of halacha. So the Rambam says it's like a drop in the ocean. 
and the explanation of all the principles on all, the, on all of these two chapters. We didn't do much explaining. We just gave the principles. To explain those principles, is that which the sages have called the work of the chariot. When the sages refer to the work of the chariot, they mean the discussion related to Hashem's existence and the angels, those that are the highest level of creation. The earliest sages have commanded that we should not expound upon these things in public, only to one individual at a time. And even that one individual, he has to be wise and he has to be perceptive on his own. You have to be able to give him a start, give him, give him a little push, give him a little boost, and he goes on his own and understands things. Only if he's such a wise man and then we give him just the heads of the chapters, the basic outline points. And we let him know just a small bit of the matter. And he then understands with his own capacity and knows the end of the matter and its depth. We don't just communicate it in public. Why are we doing it now in public? In fact, in recent years, we learned Chassidus in public. Says the Rebbe, there's nothing inherently wrong with teaching this Torah, this part, of the, this part of the wisdom of Hashem in public. The problem is in the human, that the human will misinterpret it. Today, says the Rebbe, we have the principle of eight, la sot, la Hashem, heferu terasecha. When it comes to doing things for the sake of Hashem, sometimes we have to cancel and abolish principles that existed until now. We saw in the introduction to the Rambam, that was the reason why the Mishnah was written down. Students were becoming forgetful, persecution was becoming great, Rebbe wrote the Mishnah so people could have a tangible work of Torah Shabbat, the oral Torah. In the same way, these Hasidic concepts became so necessary for the human to survive in today's society that we abolished that rule of, of, of individual teaching and we said, you know what, now it's out in the open. Everybody can learn Hasidus. And also, it's a preparation to Mashiach. Because in Mashiach times, that's what we're going to be doing all day, knowing Hashem. May as well prepare and get ready now. And Rama concludes, These things are very deep, very, very deep. Not every mind can handle them. And it was about these pieces of wisdom that Solomon the king said in his great wisdom, Lambs for your clothing. What does that mean, lambs for your clothing? So said our sages in explanation of this metaphor. The word kvasim should be read as kvashim, hidden. Those things that stand in the most hidden recesses of creation, should be in your clothes. Claim our just for you, just for you alone. The Al and do not expound upon them in public. about them. He also said, They should be for you alone, with no strangers together with you. about them. He also said, Honey and milk should be under your tongue. So said our sages, the earliest sages, those things, those secret parts of a Torah that are sweet, like honey and milk, have to be reserved for the right people. They should be kept under your tongue, not revealed in public. But again, in our days, we do make a point of actually studying Chassidus in public, delving into the depths of Hashem, because that is what prepares us for the coming of Mashiach. And with that, we conclude the second chapter, today's chapter of Rambam.